the version in the gospel recorded by Matthew cha in chapter 5 which we call the long version because the other version of Luke is the short version and the uh, essential thing again is to remember that this is the master, the Lord Jesus delivering the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest man who ever lived without looking can you tell me the last word in the Old Testament what's the last word? son? cursed, cursed is the last word <coughs> and it's significant that Jesus begins his sermon by saying blessed remember in the Old Testament there was a time when Moses went on the mountain <coughs> and all the mountain trembled and if a beast went near to the mountain it died so great was the majesty and power of God here we have the very opposite we have a gentle you know something atmosphere something like the mountains there I don't like the title it says the Sermon on the Mount and it kind of fixes the mountain in your in your thinking more than the substance it's the substance that matters not the mountain and I think again it's correct to say that Jesus was speaking only to his disciples because as you read the first verse in the eighth chapter it says when he was come down from the mountain great multitudes followed him so apparently those multitudes had not been with him on the mountain I think old Bishop Vaughan, uh, he must have been right, he was an Englishman, and uh, Bishop Vaughan said that he figured that the disciples were immediately around Jesus and the other men, you know, they were eavesdropping, they were kind of getting the uh, message as the wind blew it in that direction. This is, the Sermon on the Mount is, is a total impossibility for the world. Men have tried to make a social gospel, they've substantiated their arguments, you know, you to feed the poor, you to do this, do the other, that, that's, that's true that periphery though what he's talking here uh, about here he's talking precisely to his disciples and he's talking about entering into the kingdom of heaven now some people think the kingdom of heaven is far off millions of people in thousands of churches have said hundreds of times thine is the kingdom the power and the glory or they've said thy kingdom come thy will be done and if you ask them well it's right some Sunday when you're going past the church they did you say what is called the Lord's Prayer which isn't the Lord's Prayer it's the disciples prayer the Lord's Prayer is John 17 the disciples could not pray John 17 and Jesus could not pray what we call the Lord's Prayer but they they say thy, um, thy kingdom come thy will be done now if you ask them what is the kingdom of God they say well you know like the old song there is a happy land far far away but Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you and he says that if you're going to go put, get your priorities straight in the, <coughs> pardon me, in the Christian life that what we have to do is look at that, um, which verse is it? 33 of chapter 6 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, these things that, uh, you know, we get worried about your clothes and other things you know, the, I've never seen a sparrow with a nervous breakdown, have you? Sparrows don't get worried. It's just human beings that get worried. The birds in the air, they, they don't sow, but they, they get their food all right. And yet we get so concerned, we, we get caught up with trivia. Some of you, anybody here from Christian Missionary Alliance? No, well, they're known more in the north, but their great founder was Dr. A.D. Simpson, who was a Presbyterian minister, then he saw the light, <coughs> but anyhow, uh, he wrote many lovely things and in his great writings he, he spoke about the temporal transient things round about us and he called them perishing things of clay born but for one brief day and it's amazing how anxious the godly people are and that's a prohibition be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving make your request no unto to God worry is not legal in the Christian life my dear mother was very smart I take after my father but anyhow my mother was very smart and you know she had a lot of wonderful axioms and, and um, smart sayings and she would say to us as children now if you trust you do not worry and if you worry you do not trust you can't have faith and fear they don't mix they don't go together we have no need to be afraid of anything or anybody if we're really walking in the light 
that God has given to us and have the strength of the Spirit to do it. Uh, we've argued a bit earlier before some of you came that uh, here it says in the second verse of this chapter he opened his mouth. Well they say he couldn't talk through his ears, could he? Nobody, he, Jesus had to open his mouth but it doesn't mean he just articulated clearly or that he had eloquence as we think of it. It means that when he opened his mouth he, he spoke with authority and not like the scribes. You remember they sent the temple guards to arrest him on one occasion and they came back without Jesus. And the big chief said, well, why didn't you bring him? And they said, well, never man spake like this man. In other words, they went to arrest him with their hands and their clubs and whatever else they had, bows and arrows or something. But he arrested them with his words. They stopped dead in their tracks. Oh, he doesn't like talk like these commercial evangelists, these scribes and Pharisees, they the same old dry shibboleths, they call them out, blah, 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 but when he speaks, like he did in the garden, uh, who seek he? We seek Jesus. Well, I am he. It must have been very wonderful to hear Jesus preach. I think more wonderful to hear Jesus pray. And then he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, just to recap for a minute or two. And most of the modern translations have taken that word blessed and they've changed it to happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. I, I don't know anybody ever happy about being poor. Happy are they that mourn, happy are the meek, happy... But there's no way you can take it, that Greek word which is explained here as, as blessed, there's no way you can change it to happiness. You know, the psalmist, as he says more than once, I got an itch. Do you have some bugs around here, something? Uh, the psalmist repeatedly says, "Bless the Lord, O my soul." Now, how in the world can you bless God? What have you got to bless God with? He doesn't need your wisdom. You can hardly get through uh, your own. I mean, you don't have enough to get through yourself. So, <clears throat> he's not looking for your wisdom. He's not looking for your strength. He's not looking. For, what, what is he looking for? How can you bless the Lord? <clears throat> I'm not going to labour the two Greek words here. But there are two Greek words for blessedness. And unfortunately, they, they often get mixed up, the translators mix them up. You see, when I bless the Lord, the Greek word means I eulogize God. <coughs> uh, just as later we'll find out when it says, uh, blessed are the merciful. I can't show mercy to God. Does God want my mercy? Surely he doesn't. How can I bless God? He owns everything. I, I like the old hymn of Isaac Watts when he says that about God. He made the stars, those heavenly flames, he counts their numbers, calls their names. I'd like to have said that to Carl Sagan when he was on TV a few months ago explaining the universe, saying there are not just millions, there are not just billions, there are just trillions, there are sextillions, and, and uh, why, there are some, you know, the Milky Way isn't just one great big twisted pathway of light in the sky, there are Milky Ways that make that Milky Way look like nothing, you know. And he goes on eulogizing how vast the universe is. And I thought, that's great. That's great. I enjoy that because my father made them all. And the scripture says he knows the name of every star. And if he knows the name of every star, surely he knows your name and my name. And that ought to give us a cause for praise and adoration. But, but again, how can I bless God? As Isaac Watts says, his wisdom's vast and knows no bound. What did they say the other week? That that thing they shot up into space, what they call it, Explorer something, and it went round, where did it go? Mars? And it's gone on to another planet, and it, maybe it will be going on a hundred years from now. Oh, mercy. Must be a lot of space out there. We live in a shrinking world. Every time we invent a new plane, you know, uh, English plane, <coughs> They get over the Atlantic in three and a half hours. It took, it took Wesley three and a half months to come over. You can do the same thing in three... Every, every new thing is shrinking the world. Every new telescope is expanding the universe. And when I listened one or two nights to Carl Sagan explaining the mysteries or trying to explain the mysteries of the universe, I felt like just standing up and shouting, My God, how great thou art! He was kind of suggesting you can't believe the theory of creation from the Bible. Why not? I remember the first time I heard an old preacher in America about 1951 say that <coughs> he found out that uh, these men were right in, the, in their story of the creation of the world. He said it's like this, and he had a great big ponderous uh, dictionary, you know, one of those 
things of about 3,000 pages, enormous thing. He said, I would like to show you this. This is a modern miracle. Uh, there was a big um, print shop in Cincinnati and they had an explosion. And after the explosion, they found this, it had blown this book together. <laughs> and everybody gasped for a minute. He said, well, that's just about as likely as saying that uh, there was once a big explosion in the world and they, they put birds, you know, with one color and you never find a crow singing like a nightingale. I remember going to Australia once and, and suddenly something, something like, boom, like that and it was red and blue. And I said to the car driver, hey, hold it a minute, what was that? Oh, a flock of wild uh, parakeets or sparrow, uh, uh, parakeets or, or um, what do you call them? Um, hmm. Those colored birds? Peacocks, you know, well, they do fly. We had some peacocks uh, when they were at the other house, they used to fly to the trees up. Parrots, parrots. But you know, the more gorgeous a bird is, usually it can't sing. The plainest birds have the, have the greatest song. And very often it's like that with people. The most uh, simple people, very often unattractive, you know, just like most of you. <coughs> and uh, they, they have an inward beauty, and that's what matters. After all, the psalmist in Psalm 45 says, the king's daughter is all glorious wear. <coughs> within within we had a fellow in England not far from where I lived and, and he used to take that old saying you know that said beauty is only skin deep and he says most of us need skinning <coughs> well if it's just skin deep if you got the skin off you might find the beauty but anyhow there it is but you see there's no way in which I can bless God how can I bless God all I can do is eulogize God and that's what the Greek word there really means in, in Mary's Magnificat, she eulogized, she blessed the Lord, she magnified the Lord. I can put myself in line for his blessings by my obedience, by my, my submission, and so forth and so on. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, uh, that's the way into the kingdom. <clears throat> I think some people think that God should take them on because of so much ability. They're so clever. I mean, uh, God doesn't know what he's missing in not using me. You know, like uh, Mercy, I, I hope before I've been here a few days that this ranch they'll find out what inner ability I have. I mean, I'm loaded with wisdom and skill and knowledge and I hope I don't have to stay here three months before they discover it. I hope it'll come to the surface and they'll say, you know, that girl's a genius, that fellow's got everything. He's another Einstein, Einstein, or Epstein, or some other Stein. There's nothing that commends any of us to God, really. And the sooner we realize our poverty, well, that gives us access to God. Even the brilliant apostle, I think he was the greatest man that ever lived after Jesus, <coughs> I think he got a colossal intellect, I think he had acres of culture, and yet he isn't uh, hesitant to say that he was poor in order that he might make many rich. David the Psalmist wrote those magnificent psalms and was a king and a ruler and he had everything going for him and yet what did he say? This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. In fact God resisted the pride. If you're going anywhere at all for God, you better get rid of your pride, even if you're a straight-A student or a, some other kind of student. <clears throat> if your dad's a millionaire or he owns IBM or some other thing, forget it. That, that doesn't give any, any advantage to come to God. I, I haven't been like some of these girls, I never prostituted, I haven't been in a crazy movie, I haven't been this, that, and the other. Well, thank God you weren't, but you're still lost. That was one weakness, I think, about the moral majority that was uh, chasing around the country last year. If everybody became as righteous as Nicodemus, we'd still be lost. Because it was self-righteousness. He had impeccable morality. And yet, to use a common phrase, he was lost as a goose. Worse than that, geese aren't lost. Except up in the sky. And so the first step to, to God, to the riches that are in God, is to recognize my poverty. <clears throat> and Paul doesn't get inflated anywhere. Even when he's been the most successful of all men in spirituality, he still says, as poor, yet making many rich. You see, the richest church in the New Testament got beaten up. Looked at herself in the middle one day and said, well, there will be a church like me. I'm rich. I'm increased in goods. Plenty of money in the bank. Very fundamental in my faith. Nobody can put a finger on my life. I've needed nothing. And God said, just hold it a minute. I want to turn the mirror around. Look at you, crooked, perverted. 
You say, I'm rich and increased in goods of need and nothing, and you don't even have sense enough to know. Thou art wretched, naked, blind, poor, and miserable. That's about as polarized as you get, isn't it? And yet it's the same person. So we have to come in our poverty. Nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. I used to work in an area in England, in the city of Bath, where there were a lot of broken down dukes and wealthy people, and um, during the World War II, the staff of the British Admiralty was moved from London into Bath, and we had some stunning girls and marvellous men there, fellows who'd been to Oxford, you know, and rode in the boat, or they played rugby, and these girls had been, you know, studying music in the conservatoire at Milan, or studying painting under a one of the great modern masters in, in Belgium and um, some of them very humble, some of them very arrogant. And I remember one of them, most, one of the most beautiful women I ever saw, she just tumbled out to an altar one night and I never saw anyone as uh, completely desolate. She was a communicant in the Church of England, she had impeccable morality, she'd never gone astray. The worst thing she'd done was drink cocktails and play cards with dukes and lords. I think she'd danced in Buckingham Palace, I don't know where she hadn't been. But all oh, that night, I remember that beautiful face was distorted. She said, I am so wretched, I am so empty, I, am, I have nothing. Great. That's a great place to start when you've got nothing. You've nothing. To commend us to God except our need. Let not conscience make you linger, nor the fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. And when we come there with absolute nothing, absolute emptiness, that's the only way God will start filling us. No good saying, Lord, I'm half full, would you put a topping on it, you know? He says, no, yeah, completely empty. I'm not really naked, I mean, I have a few good points, and he says, no, I'll strip you before I clothe you, I empty you before I fill you. You have to die before you can live. And uh, blessed are the poor, all right. Blessed are they that mourn, mourn over their poverty, mourn over their inability, more, more that God is so high and holy and I'm so low and depraved and unclean and wicked and I grieve over it. <clears throat> There's not much of that done anymore. People come to God as though they're coming on, equal, on an equal level. They used to sing an old hymn in the Methodist Church, Blessed are the men of broken heart who mourn for sin with inward smart. I think W.P. Nicholson was the greatest of modern evangelists. I knew him, I listened to him, and he listened to me. I had to preach one night when he was sitting under my nose. That was almost terrifying to hear him. But you know, when he, when he made an altar call, he'd say to the people that didn't come forward, off you go, get out. He's a very rough Irishman. Go on, get out as quickly as you can. Don't talk in here. Talk, talk outside. Go on, off you go. Go on, go on. You know, I'm nervous thinking it's a cattle drive or something. <coughs> And when they all got out, he'd say, now, come on, go right up on the front row. Now, come on, what's your problem? What's your thing? And he would stay there from nine o'clock at night till midnight or one o'clock in the morning until everybody got it all out, you know. No, I've been a sinner, Lord, save me, amen. He'd say, come on now, get down. What have you done? What wrong have you done? Well, can you put that wrong right? Are you willing to make restitution? Not only repentance, restitution. Repentance is to leave the sin I've done before and show that I in earnest grieve by doing it no more. But then what about somebody whose life I've wrecked and now I can help to put it right? I was in a certain area and there was a man there, he had been bankrupt and he started up in business again and went fairly well and he went bankrupt again, but he borrowed life savings from quite a few people. One man had $5,000, another had seven, another had three, this was when the dollar, you know, wasn't sick as it is now. And he, he, he went bankrupt, bankrupt again. And then he got a friend to loan him some money and, and he built a beautiful house and a little estate and he put a lake in. And uh, again, I say money was money, he sold, he sold the whole thing for $91,000. And people thought he'd go around saying, hey, I owe you 7000 I owe you 3000 No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Oh, legally, legally, I, I don't know. No, you don't legally, but morally and spiritually it is. We're not talking about the legalism of the... Of the uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the law of the land, we're talking about what is right again in the sight of God. And if you look back, you'll have time of, of mourning. You, you have to do that. Doesn't mean you stay in the valley of the shadow of death all morning. But it's a, it's a healthy thing to have spiritual mourning. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now let's come to this.
time goes so quickly something wrong with the clocks here uh, <coughs> verse 6 blessed are they are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled mm. I've never quite understood that statement that's used so very often that we're all born equal I, I don't know how they explain that I don't think we're born equal at all uh, we, we may have be born with equal rights but we're sure not born equal <coughs> some people are born pretty dumb and some people seem to be sharp almost but as soon as they get on the feet it seems oh that he's going to be a philosopher he's going to be a lawyer he's going to be something he, he sparkles she sparkles somebody told me the other day about a child they have who is um, I think seven years of age you, you can hardly drag her from the piano and now she doesn't have to go to school she's excited because uh, right after breakfast she's there at the piano and she wants to know about Chopin and Mendelssohn and all these others you know and, and she's excited about the piano her brother goes yeah you know he joins the nation the nation as you know is in mourning now for the baseball strike <coughs> and uh, it's the worst thing that's happened since the Vietnam War <coughs> one of the things again about people is we're not born equal we're born equal in the sense that we're all born like this you know we, we've got heads and arms and eyes and, and we hopefully uh, are born reasonably healthy it was an American who said we're all made in the same mold but some of us are moldier than others <coughs> but we're all made in the same mold physically but we don't all have the same degree of intelligence that's pretty obvious we're not all born in the same social strata I miss that with girls that never uh, even had to do their own hair in the morning when they got up they rang the bell and the maid came in and they sat there in a the chair and they had their hair done for them and oh mercy what dress madam are you going to wear today so on so it's laid out for you oh everything's done rode your horse and when he came back the groomsman took it and took all the sweat off it and polished it and you went and you know relaxed and after that hard work you needed a good big stiff glass of lemonade and something you know you needed to rest an hour and uh, they, they live it it's unbelievable how some people live on the other hand end of the scale it's unbelievable how other, uh, unbelievable how other people live a man came to see me Sunday he was going to come in the afternoon and then he was coming in the evening and his car broke down he arrived about 10 o'clock at night but he's working um, Oh, I don't know how many miles south of Monterey. Is it Monterey there in, in Mexico? Well, he's working down there anyhow. And he said, you know, in that town, all over the place, there are little churches here, there, and everywhere. When you get further down in the country <coughs> where he's working, in the, uh, and everywhere there's logging, <coughs> he said, there's not so much show of the churches. And further down still, there's a canyon. He said, it's like a miniature Grand Canyon. Just like a big gash as though some giant you know, scoop the dirt out. And in there, there's a, there's a pocket where there are Indians that can't speak a word of Spanish and they can't speak a word of English. They're distinctive by their features, they're distinctive by their clothes, they wear a kind of baggy pants round. They don't know if the language has ever been reduced to writing, I don't think they have a word of the gospel. And yet you get on a plane, if you could get one there and just drop off in Mexico City, a uh, city, one of the largest cities in the world, by the year 2000, it will have 30 million people in the city. Imagine that. It will be bigger than some country. I remember going to Australia and we got to a lonely part on the north where, northwest, where there were some Aborigines. And I remember flying over one, one night from, uh, where did we fly from? Sydney, going up into... Uh, into New Guinea and, and I looked down but in, that's a few years since before the jets were there and the planes didn't fly more than about 14,000 or 15,000 feet and all over the ground there were great big pockets of fire why? because the folk don't wear any clothes and in the daytime it's scorching and at night it's freezing so, so what do they do? they make a fire there they make a fire here and they, they lie in between and I have a picture of an old man who rolled over in his sleep rolled into the fire burned his beard off burned his hair made a terrible mess of him but Sydney, Australia, my goodness that's a gorgeous city it has maybe the most modern, most beautiful uh, opera house in the world it has all wonderful delights and, and you get this 
horrible antithesis. You get the, here the highest coach in the world and then you get degradation not far off. And a young fellow said to me, I'm going to be a missionary. I thought, oh, oh, good, good. I know he's going up to one of the seven great big sections of Aborigines. Oh, where are you going? He said, America. Oh, you're going to be a missionary in America? Yeah. Have you heard of a certain tribe, so and so? Do you know there's a tribe of Indians on the, on the west coast of Canada that, that live just as almost as uncivilized as they've done for a thousand years? Well, most Americans don't know that. Maybe most of you couldn't recite the name of ten tribes of Indians in America tonight. And it's much easier and exciting to say, oh, I'm, go I'm going down to the Philippines, you know. I I'm going in the jungle up in the Philippines. I'm going up where the men wear uh, bone through their nose and feathers four feet high and paint their chest up in... Um, up in New Guinea. Well, I've been up there. It's pretty frightening, too, to see them. I wanted to go over a range of mountains uh, higher than those things, and they say, oh, no, 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 not without a government permission. Three men have gone over, never come back. There's cannibals over there. They'll eat you. I have grieved, honestly, this last week, particularly, over the fact that 95% of the gospel of the grace of God is taught to 5% of the world's population. So that 5% of the preaching goes to 95% of the world's population. Now, come on, how are you going to work that out? Well, you say, God never called me to the mission field. He didn't have to call you. He told you to go. You have to have a call to stay at home. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, that was to the disciples. Well, uh, the, uh, the, the word to the disciples, where you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost, but you claim that. Are you choosing? You claim what you want and neglect what you want and live as you want. Remember old Bonhoeffer, some of you won't, except that he was in World War II and he would have died. For me, he would have lived uh, if the Americans had got to his, I don't know where it was, Buchenwald, the Dachau, the camp he was in, and the Americans got there about four days after he'd been put to death. But one of his statements that he loved to, to, to give was this, when God calls a man, he calls him to die. That doesn't mean to say you're going to be martyred somewhere. He calls you to die. Die to all your ambitions. Die to your own plans. Die to what you want to do. And then start living. See, we live in a mad world. Totally mad. It gets more insane every hour. We're spending billions of dollars on how to burn other countries up. And they're spending billions on how to uh, burn us up. I don't think it's very sane. Blessed are they who... What? Hunger. Well, it doesn't matter whether we're black or white or red or any other colour, whether you're rich, whether you live in Buckingham Palace or you live in a hovel. hovel. Everybody gets hungry. There's a level on which we're all born equal. Now, do you, do you, have you ever been to one of these swell banquets, uh, blank, bank, uh, blanket, <coughs> banquets, banquets where, you know, the table's groaning and you're looking and oh, oh, I remember once I'd been preaching in a meeting and this fellow said to me, I want you to come to my home tomorrow. I didn't know a thing about him. He came up in a, a Cadillac. That was when rich people have them. I have one now. But mine cost $10 in case it troubles you, so don't worry why I have a Cadillac. This guy drove me to his home and when I got in, I, I you know, I said, well, uh, <coughs> I didn't want to show him how. I was amazed. The house was loaded. He was a millionaire. And this was supper, Saturday night. And a lady came in in a nice little uniform. She had a turkey on a dish like this. She took the turkey and put it at the end of the table. Then brought a the whole ham and put it at the other end of the table. Brother, did we have food? I thought, this guy's got mixed up. He thinks he's feeding the 5,000. The table was just about bending with every delicacy you could think. I know, I hope you're going to enjoy yourself, you know. The Lord wants us to enjoy ourselves. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Why, that was something. You know, somehow I thought if I ate as much as I could there, I, I might be hungry before the week was out. You know, that song was very smart. I'm pressing on the upward way. Some people think that sometime I'm going to put me to place a, go get to a place of finality. Some people represent, if you're the, the holiness group, you get entirely sanctified. If you're Pentecostal, you get filled with the Spirit, and that's the plateau, and you live on it. That, that's the end of everything. Yes, it is. The beginning end. 
That's all it is. It's the beginning end. But hunger is normal. <coughs> Somebody says, uh, how do you feel? I'm not I'm hungry. Oh, what's wrong? A bit of stomach trouble, a bit of it. It's only when we're off colour that, that we lose our appetites. Normally, we're made to eat and uh, we're made to drink. And almost everybody that comes to America for the first time goes down the street and says, Hey, what's that? Taco Bell. Oh, that's where you get some Mexican... Ca oh, oh, I see. Wendy, what does Wendy do? Is she a sewing class? <laughs> no, Wendy makes kind of a sloppy hamburger. But what's a sloppy joe? And what's a torpedo? Twelve-inch torpedo? What's a torpedo? <laughs> and then a bit, get a bit further, you know, it's Mr. Burger, and then it's uh, Whopper, Whopper Burger or somebody. <laughs> Mercy, every go down the street, all you see going down the street, as soon as one sign goes up, oh, now there's a change, Long John Silver, what does he have? He has fish and chips. Oh. Captain D, what does he have? Oh, he has a bit of, uh, maybe a bit better class than the others. And all you see going down any main street, and when you've been in one modern city, you've been in the mall. We've been in the mall. There are no hills in modern streets. We, the cities, we level the whole ground out with bulldozers. No curves in the road. Blue, north, south, east, west, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't get lost. <laughs> you know, go, go down. Oh, maybe some of you could, but uh, <coughs> we don't all have that ability. But anyhow, you go down the, the average new city I'm talking about. And I'm talking about New York or, or Frisco up the hills and, you know, break your neck and kind of thing. I'm talking about these new cities, and they expand new cities, they're all north, south, east and west. No hills, it's all level. Go down Main Street, uh -huh, there's Tresby, there's Kmart, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so, there's Killers, and there's somebody else. Everybody's got in blue, 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 blah, blah, blah. It's all blah, it's all just so artificial. But most people that have come to America that I've seen, and I've seen them in a number of countries, and they say, you know, when I got to America, I was overwhelmed with how much they eat. <laughs> Everybody's eating. You go in the shopping mall, and the guy, he's <laughs> chewing away, and then he dumps his dirty, wet little thing in the, you know, Coke on it or something, and I, man alive. We drink enough Coke. Do you know the Coke people love days like this? Everybody gets the thirsty men on the building site. They'll drink five or so, literally five or six cokes in a day. What do they say on a good day in America? Something like 500 million <coughs> cokes or sodas are drunk in a day. <sighs> so obviously we should be the healthiest nation, but you know we're one of the richest, perhaps the richest nation in the world. But you know we're about number twelve on the on the international scale of health. We're about number twelve. Children in school are somewhere around about 15. Education so bad. <laughs> All that we can show is chromium finished stuff and, and that kind of stuff. Well, why? We don't eat right. We don't drink right. But Jesus says here, blessed are they, what? Are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Well, I'll tell you. This can be classified, we can put this in various areas. You can be hungry mentally. And it's a shame that many of us are not. I've got a son, he has an earned PhD. I've got three sons. Two missionaries, one is working as a doctor in a university in West Africa. All the boys have been avid readers ever since they could read. Some of them could read before they went to school. I think two of them went to school when they were three and a half. And they're tremendous readers. I've crossed the Atlantic about 20 times on the United States, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, what have you got? And I used to like to go into a recess in the lounge of the Queen Mary because, not that I was one of them, but there was a group of intellectuals usually gathered in that area. And I would sit and listen to them talking. Remember, there was one man one week and he had uh, one day as we crossed and just a few days before he left for the boat in Southampton he had been to see Winston Churchill at the Chequers as the residence is called of the Prime Minister. And he'd been down to the Chequers and uh, uh, he'd eaten in the home and discussed some things with Winston Churchill. There were other men there, scientists. There was the leading preacher <coughs> of the world at that time sitting there. 
and I, I, I sort of kind of a crossfire, you know. They were talking about moral things and, and uh, intellectual things and spirit, and sometimes spiritual things, but scientific things, and uh, about the war and various other things. And, and it made me think again, my, what, what, what an amazing capacity the human mind has. What we can absorb. You know, they say that the most, the biggest part of learning has happened in a child by the age of five. The pity we don't let children go to school when they're three, they learn an awful lot. Most countries, Europe, they have to go before they're five. We try to drag it out to the other end, you know, and when they're too interested in girls or too interested in sport or something to even bother about study or getting down to serious thinking. But again, the mind is capable, it, it, it has a tremendous hunger. You get fellows who have a hunger for fame. In one sense, that's natural. You get a man who's uh, hungry for the, 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 the t top, the highest peak in his profession. I worked in a tailor's factory until I was about 19. And I used to cut suits. And I, I was in a special section where we cut suits for deformed people. That was, that was an intricate, <laughs> difficult, a very fascinating work. And there was one man there, and I worked right opposite him. I had a table three and a half yards long. He had a table there, you know, you need three and a half yards of cloth for a suit. And whenever anything came in that nobody else could cut in the factory, that man could always cut it. For instance, somebody wanted an opera cloak. Well, you don't usually find those in uh, Goodwill stores, do you? Or some other place. You could go in a hundred shops and say, uh, excuse me, do you have an opera cloak? What? Opera cloak. One of those big swirling things that buttons around your neck and... Oh, no, no, I know what you mean. Like Dracula wears. <laughs> no, no, we, we don't have any... Uh, here. You know, they brought that man a great length of cloth and... and uh, cloth is usually 30, 30 inches wide with a double edge and we opened it to 60 and then we folded it this way. And, and he made, he designed on that cloth an opera cloth. Why? Because for about four years he never went to a movie house. He never went to any sports place. Every night after he'd been working in the factory, he'd have his supper, bathe and go upstairs and he would work and design and get his mind fixed on all these riding breeches. They're very, very difficult to cut if you cut stylish. Uh, gentlemen's tail coats. Uh, all kinds of odd things that hardly ever come up. That that guy was on the board. He carried a little notebook with him, you know, about four inches by two and a half, and he had little notes in, and he'd turn that thing in, and guys would say, hey, can I see that? No, you can't see it. That, that was his uh, Encyclopedia Britannica kind of thing. He had his little germ thoughts there. But what did he do? Um, <clears throat> and he think it was an old poetry that said what? The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight but they while their companions slept were toiling upward in the night see you get nothing free in this world except failure and the more you pay the better thing you expect if you buy a toyota you don't expect it to be a Rolls royce if you do it won't be let me warn you in case you think of buying one you don't expect to buy a Rolls Royce at the price of a Toyota. There's a price to pay for everything. There's a price in the spiritual life. We, we never build a Bible school with an assembly line that everybody takes the same studies and drops off with the same degree, even of Bible knowledge, never mind spiritual development. Now notice what it says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after what? Gifts of the Spirit? No. Ministries? No. Knowledge, no. They all have their part, but first, the primary thing is, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. If you go to England, uh, you should do, complete your education, but uh, go to London and go up, um, what's the street called? Oh, anyhow, Westridge Chapel's up there, for City Road, go up City Road, and you'll see Westridge Chapel. When I was a young fellow, there was a, a prince of a preacher there by the name of Moffat Gautry. He had a man, an elastic vocabulary, you'd think he'd swallowed the dictionary. He was a great preacher too. He filled that pulpit with distinction. And he used to say this, the person who only wants his sins forgiven, forgiven, is toying with Christianity. 
see many of us want the image, one get rid of guilt, fear, I don't want to go to hell, I want to go to heaven, I want to find a nice guy to marry, a nice girl or something, that, that's it. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. What did he say? He's saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after godlikeness or, or, or holiness. I read some stuff about H.G. Wells today and it reminded me of a statement H.G. Wells said. He said, there's a God-shaped blank in every one of us. I don't know if it's round or square or diamond shaped. I don't, you know what it means. There's a God-shaped blank that only God can fill. Or if you remember Augustine said, God made us for himself and without him we're not complete and we're not satisfied. Now, now we've translated the word, or somebody's translated the word in most of the modern translations, happy is the matter. Happy? Oh no, no, I throw that out. Happy, happy, happy. Happy depends on happening. If everything happens, oh, you know what, I got this one, I got a letter, my aunt uh, sent me $25, boy, I feel great, when can we go shopping? Only better hurry because take $25 worth of gas to get to town and back before long. $25 is not much. But how we go up and down, you know, with these terrible things we call emotions, that either we conquer them or they conquer us, moods that either you get under your feet or they get you down. No, 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 happiness depends on happening. The, the, the root is hap or chance. But, but, this blessedness we're talking about, which can also be translated joy in the Lord, is totally independent of, well, uh, I'm trying to think who it was, I'm not sure whether it was Madame Guillaume or F.W. Faber that said, could I be cast where thou art not? That were indeed a dreadful spot. But with thee, my Lord, to guide the way, it is equal joy to go or stay. When she was shut up in prison, She's very philosophical about it. A little bird am I, shut off from fields of air, content within this cage to lie, since God has placed me here. Well pleased a prisoner to be, because, my God, it pleaseth thee. A lady phoned me almost, she, she's phoned me for about three weeks. She comes up with every twisted thought about her spiritual life, and she said, yes, I think God's forsaken me, he's left me, and I said, well, you shouldn't worry about that. Shouldn't worry about it? Why? I said, you're not responsible for his attitude to you. All you're responsible is your attitude to him. Praise him. Rejoice. Because he's left me. No, because he's been with you so often. And now when you miss him, he's gone. You feel he's gone. I said, I doubt that he has. But remember, Madame Guillen was in a prison with walls 30 feet thick, which is maybe about the width of this room or a little thicker. And she lost her home, her family, her children, her husband, her wealth. And she stood up, shut up in a stinking prison that we wouldn't let people live in today. And she said, it's, it's beautiful living here. Hmm? And then she said, when my priest couldn't come to me, my preacher couldn't come to me, my husband couldn't come, he was dead, the children couldn't come, they were gone, my fortune had gone, my servants had gone, everything had gone. And then she said, for some reason I don't quite understand, it pleased the Lord to leave me too. And she said he didn't speak to me for five years. But I loved him just as much. I said, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I know what I'm going to do. I'm not responsible for your attitude to me. I'm responsible for my attitude to you. And so she wrote some of the best poetry when she was in the most horrible situation. Well, that's, that's the time when you prove your Christian experience. It's, it's uh, a time when you prove whether it's just about that depth in your mind or whether it's got down here into, the, into your heart and into your will and into the seat of your affections. Blessed are they who hunger. Ooh, I used to go in some day and my mother would say, Hey, you're ravenous, aren't you? I'd say, Yes, well, can I eat now? No, you can't. You know, my hands are never really dirty. <coughs> what little boy has dirty hands? You go and wash your hands. But my mind what? You go and wash your hands. Oh, but oh, was I dying to, as we say, to get to that food. Do you remember the psalmist when he said, My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God? See, you, we, we, don't, we don't convince God by our theology. We don't con convince God by how hard we work. We don't convince God by how many tracts we give out, how many people get saved. No, 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 no. I don't know who wrote it. I didn't have time to check it. We've been in the world this last few days. 
But I remember uh, one hymn writer who said, my goal is God himself. Not joy, not peace, not even blessing, but thee, my God. Popularity poll, you may be down tomorrow. Some of these guys, you know, they're on top of the musical chart. My goodness, for a few weeks they're on top, and then whoop, and then you don't hear them, and you find they're discouraged, and they're taken to dope, or suicide, or some other thing. Oh, they lived on the euphoria and the excitement of being on the charts and well-known and, and all this kind of business. But you see, when we're talking about the righteous, blessed are, <coughs> are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, what we're saying in essence is, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after God. Not the service of God, but God himself. After all, is there again anything more wonderful on earth that I, 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 you, poor, lost sinner, can uh, lose our own self-righteousness? And, and, and that's exactly what Jesus did. He took uh, our, our, our righteousness and he became unrighteous in the sense that he became sin for us. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. <clears throat> Tell me that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, that's why I said the kingdom of God is within you. I don't have to go to heaven, I live in heaven. As Spurgeon said, a little bit of faith will take you to heaven, a bit more will bring heaven to you. Now where do you live? Do you live on this ranch or do you live in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? I mean, you get some rotten, stinking job to do on the farm one night. Sit up with a cow that's in labor and get messed up with uh, all the stuff that comes away and all the rest of it and you come at home at three o'clock in the morning and say my goodness this is I'd rather hear a message on sanctification than this you know after all it's working it out working it in is one thing but the scripture says work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling Again, there's no such thing as having one meal that's going to satisfy you for the rest of your life. It would be nice if it would in this state of economy. There's no such thing as coming to a plateau where I've no more height to gain. Paul prays for people who are filled with God that also they might be filled with the knowledge of his will. There are many areas in which we can be filled after we're filled. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, not after ministries necessarily, not after, after gifts, though they're good too. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And that's just not first class morality or impeccable morality. That's good. You can, you can have impeccable morality, nobody lay a finger on you, and yet still be unrighteous in the sight of God. He's talking about another righteousness. That's the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Again, quoting the psalmist, he says, My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Is, is that your normal Christian life? Or do you just hit the peaks when you come to a fellowship meeting like this? I mean, whether you're chasing cows or cutting wood or doing some other thing or getting your fingers in the machine where they shouldn't be, and you get them trapped or messed up with print, printer's dye or something else. It, it, is there a deep inward consciousness that you have union with God, that you're thirsting after God? I'm trying to think, Moses, Moses in the 33rd of Exodus says, show me thy way. And about three verses after that, he says, show me thy glory. Well, if I'd been through everything Moses had been through, I, I would have thought I'd seen a lot. Wouldn't you? I mean, if you'd stood on a, on a peak overlooking a sea and just taken a, a rod like that and said, divide in the name of the Lord, it divided. Phew. Another day you commanded a rock to split and water to come out. If you saw a, a god uh, close the sea up behind you and all your enemies floating around the next day, all the bodies were there. If you've been on a mountain with God, as he'd been in the 24th chapter, alone with God, nobody else there. Wouldn't you think he'd just about seen everything in the book? Or come again to the amazing Apostle Paul writing to the Philippians. He says, oh, my earthly life. Now here he was, he's an aristocrat. Remember he was born in the ancient city of where? Where was he born? 
passes. That's where he started. Where did he finish? He finished in the greatest city in the world at that time, Rome. The capital city of the great Roman Empire. So he's born in Tarsus, that's where he starts. The capital of the old world, he finishes up in the capital of military power. In between he went to the capital of religion, which was Jerusalem. He went to the capital of intellectualism, Athens. He went to the capital of religion, Jerusalem. This man is riding from prison to the Philippians market. And he's in a stinking, lousy, horrible, smelly prison, getting the rottenest food you can imagine. And you know what he says? He says, I press toward the mark of it. Hey, come on, you're writing fairy stories. You mean to say that deep down in this stinking prison, maybe nobody's prayed for you today. The jailer cursed you when he went out, and they're going to chop your head off tomorrow. You're still pressing on the upward way? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what about all your achievements? I mean, look, nobody's written as many epistles as you have, nobody else ever will. What about all your scholarship? What about your social standing? Remember once he got arrested and they were scared to death when they found he was a Roman? And not only a Roman, he says, I was freeborn. Oh, you, you, you were freeborn? Yeah, my, my father's a freedom of the, I had the freedom of the city and I was freedom. Oh, the Roman uh, centurion says, I obtained the, my freedom uh, uh, with a great price. Well, everything was going for God. It wasn't a thing that he needed in his natural life. You talk about revelation. And yet he says, I'm still pressing toward the prize for the mark, uh, I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. And I count everything but done. That's pretty offensive, isn't it? You don't read that kind of thing in the modern, you, you, you say, count it everything as fertilizer. <coughs> Dung's a pretty rough word. And yet that's what he says. I'm still thirsting. I've had every experience you can imagine. I've cast out demons, I've, I've healed the sick. Now I've been in jail, I've confronted some of the greatest kings of the earth. I've been every every rung of the ladder socially and seen everybody and been in prisons and palaces and, and in shipwrecks and seen God and miraculous things but he says, oh, I push them. I'm thirsting, I'm thirsting, I want to know him. Some people just want to know their Bible. Wesley has a hymn is, and, and he describes Mary and, and he makes Mary say, all that I could forever sit like Mary at the Master's feet be this my only joy. My pure delight, my inward bliss, my joy, my heaven on earth is this, to sit at Jesus' feet. And old Samuel Rutherford was in a rock on the, off the coast of Scotland. If you go, you can still see that big tower standing in the water. That it's been beaten with the, with the storm for three or four hundred years, and he's in that stinking prison. And it was there that, uh, the, at least from what he wrote there, that they extracted sections and wrote that hymn, The, the Sands of Time Are Sinking. And in it he says, the bride eyes not her garments, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze on glory, but on the King of grace. Not at the crown he gifted, her, but on his pierced hand, when throned where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. With mercy and with judgment my web of time he wove. And I, the dew of sorrow, was lusted by his love. I bless the hand that guided, I bless the heart that planned. When throned where glory dwelleth, in Emmanuel's land. For some reason, I don't quite know why, yesterday I started thinking about a man who was born in 1700 and he died in 1760. He became very famous because later he, he became a friend of Wesley's and his name was Baron Ludwig Baron Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Fancy having to write that at the bottom of every time they said sign your name. Wouldn't that be something? Hmm? Social Security, go to the bank, whatever it was. Baron Nicholas. Ludwig. Von Zinzendorf. When he was a young man, he lived on a big estate. He was very wealthy and they... A sect of brethren out there in uh, the other side of Germany had been almost wiped out in a massacre. They were hated by the government. 
and so this rich glorious man he he brought them all down to his estate and he fixed up shacks for them he fixed up homes for them he traveled a bit he came to america he went to a place called pennsylvania and if you go there now a little town you know called what nazareth and uh, bethlehem and hebron and those were all the towns he lived in and established little churches way back in the 1700s later he, he, he met wesley went to england and met wesley and they struck up a friendship but he wrote a beautiful hymn As a matter of fact, he wrote quite a few hymns. I think it was Zinzendorf who was in an art gallery in Sweden, and there's a picture of Christ on the cross, you know, in that usual languid position, his head down on his shoulders. Over. And underneath it uh, was written, This have I done for thee, what hast thou done for me? And he put his head down, began to think, Well, that's all he did for me. My goodness. What have I done for him? Another day he was having a kind of a surge in his spirit and he wrote this, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress, midst flaming worlds in these arrayed with joy shall I lift up my head. Bold shall I stand in that great day for who ought to my charge shall lay, fully absolved from these I am, from fear and sin and guilt and death. When from the dust of death I rise to claim my mansion in the skies, this then be all my joy and plea, Jesus has lived and died for me. My beauteous dress, having got rid of my own filthy self-righteousness through the blood of the cross, having the Spirit of God come and self is thrown off the altar and Christ comes. So I'm no longer self-seeking, self-interested, self-pitying, self-glorying. In that great old hymn that I haven't heard sung for years that A.B. Simpson wrote, Not I, but Christ, be honored and loved and exalted. We're never going to persuade the world by theology. We're going to persuade it by the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Most of you know Joe Foss, I was talking with him this morning. And Joe had been up to, um, where have you been? He'd been up to Canada, <coughs> Winnipeg. Uh, just a church, not one of the super churches. And he took a team with him and they went on the streets, they went to the seven, you know, seven eleven shops and the hangouts of all the kids and invited them all to church and they came. And they got through to a lot of the kids and a lot of them got saved and they went home and told the parents, parents, some of the parents came to church. And on the Sunday morning the pastor stood up and said, look, I want to make a statement before, before the service this morning. I have never seen Christianity, I have been preaching 17 years and this is the purest interpretation of the gospel I've ever seen. These men are filled with love and compassion and gentleness. And he said, before the service starts, I, I want to come out of the pulpit and come down to the altar and I want to publicly acknowledge my failure and I want to publicly repent. And if any of you deacons would like to join me, would you please come forward? And they got up and they came. And then he said, if anybody in the church would like to come, and the whole church came. And they all knelt there. And it was a time of weeping and confession. Not because they'd heard a brilliant sermon, but because people had been met on a one-to-one -one basis kids have been told there's something better than goofing up and fooling around in sex or fooling around with drugs or fooling around with other things you see there's, there's, there's one thing that the pursuit of what? what what does the constitution of the United States say we're guaranteed what pursuit of what life liberty and the pursuit of happiness well, just as we finish, can you think of anything that's pursued more than happiness tonight? My goodness, these are tarry games and heaven knows what. There's one company now selling, uh, I don't know how much it is, how many different games they have. You can stick in your TV and, and they're great. They're wonderful. If you want to destroy hours, if you want to waste your Bible study time, if you don't want to pray, I mean... If your little mind just needs amusement, you want to shoot imaginary airplanes up and press a button and shoot it down and think that will put another star in your crown, well, you're going to be in trouble because it won't. The pursuit of happiness. 
You go to bed tonight, you wake up at one o'clock in the morning, and say, oh, it's one or six more hours to sleep. And folks will still be jazzing around in discos half naked, and they'll be drunk, and they'll be fooling around. Oh my, the God of this world gets a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of pleasure. Pursuit of happiness. And you know what? A lot of Christians expect to find something to make them happy. And I tell you again, as I said before, new to some of you anyhow. The more joy you have in the Lord, and the less entertainment you need. If he's your center and your circumference, other things can go. I remember the youngster, I'm through with this, being told about a man who was traveling over the Sahara Desert. I've never been to the Sahara Desert, and to be honest, I don't want to go either. It's that great stretch from, from just about Central Africa way up to the north there. Do you know across the north section of, of, of the Sahara Desert, there are hundreds of churches buried that used to flame with the gospel, and they were destroyed by Islam. A man said he would cross a certain part of the desert, and so he did like every traveler. He got the best camel he could, and he got a bag of rice, and he got a bag of dates, and he got a bag of uh, a leather skin of water. And like so many others, he got lost. And finally his camel died under him because he wouldn't give the cow the water the camel. And he got less and less of his dates, and less and less of his rice, and drank less and less of his water, but soon the rice had gone, and the dates had gone, and finally the water had gone. And he had enough strength to, to, to walk, and, and he, he kept seeing mirages, you know, and, and, but he struggled on until his hands were all sore with the sands, and his claws were torn, and he was in a mess, and then suddenly he spied a bag, a pouch. Ah, oh, there it is, some man was trying to make his camel go quickly, and, and, and the pouch fell off. It's, it's water, or, or dates, all right. When he got up to it with his nervous hands in the sun stalking, he got over it and opened it and it was full of pearls and he cursed and threw it down. What good are pearls to a starving man? A dying man? Now when you go home, read how often in, in the sixth chapter when you go home, I mean when you go to your room, whatever it is. Read how often Jesus says in, in the sixth chapter of, of John, I guess it mentions bread more than any other chapter, but do you remember what he says? I am the bread of life. Now you can live without Danish, and you can live without wedding cakes, and you can live without all those fancy things that ladies make. You can't live without bread. And you can't drink water forever, and you can't drink cokes and tea and coffee forever. You can live basically on water and bread. And Jesus says, I'm your basic need. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. And even eaters of me. Now here's the test. He never hungers. Any of you ever remember, oh, you, you're not as old as I am, are you? No. <laughs> uh, but there's, a, there's a, an old hymn that says, there's no thirsting for the things of the world, they've taken wings. Anybody ever heard that one? You didn't hear it? Why do you hear it then? Watch it. Oh, good. You're a Nazarene? Very good. <laughs> I preached for the Nazarenes for years. My sisters, I have one sister, she's a Nazarene too. They, they sing that still. There's no thirsting for the things of the world. They've taken wings. Long ago I gave them up an instant. Say, all my night was turned to day. All my burdens rolled away. Now the comforter abides with me. Well, there's a proof. You don't need to sit down and answer 20 questions. I mean, what are you thirsting for in the world tonight? What has he got to offer you? Why do you have that appetite? If God has worked a miracle, if you become a new creation, then you've got new appetites. You see those lovely butterflies going, you know, and, and, yuck. A few months ago they were horrible little caterpillars. You tread on one, it bursts and it comes out all green. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? But look at it now. Oh, wow. We had a moth in our yard the other week. I'd never seen it like it. I, I, oh, it was huge. When I got a hold of it, to try and get it out of a position, let it go free. You know, it, its wings were all dead. It was a huge thing, and yet it was very beautiful. But you know, once a butterfly becomes a butterfly, it doesn't go back to all the filth that it used to eat when it was a, a caterpillar. Or a dragonfly that's lived in the mud and dirt at the bottom of the lake for, I think, seven years in the muck and the mire and the dark and the filth. Once it comes to the surface, it floats to the surface, it looks like an acorn. 
and it stays there until the sun dries it, then whoopee, out comes this beautiful, beautiful dragonfly. Well, I've seen them skimming down to the edge of the water. I remember asking my boys one day in Ireland, I said, do you think it's trying to get back into the mud? And they all said, no, Daddy, I won't want to go down in all that filth. You know, a man has to realize his own filthiness. Have you ever thought in that story of the, of the prodigal? It's a marvelous story. I like to preach on it. It's, it'll give me about an hour and a half. You remember in the story of the prodigal, when he was hungry, where did he go? He went to the hog. But when he was starving, he went to his father. And there's a lot of people who are just hungry and they go here and they go there and they go somewhere else. Some people want to feed on sermons. Some people have a, a, an insatiable appetite just to, to eat the Bible. And it doesn't get down into the nature. But if we're really born again of the Spirit, well, well there's only one way to live. You've got to eat and you've got to drink. And you've got to breathe. And prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air. You can tell how spiritually healthy you are by your appetite for the Word, by your appetite for prayer, by the appetite for worship, when in either praying or reading, we're just gazing on God's holiness, keeping in mind on His majesty, on His purity, on His holiness. And it's not going to get any better. It is really getting better, but it's, it's getting worse in one sense. You say, look, I, I used to be able to get a Bible with ten minutes reading my Bible and five minutes prayer, and now I spend two hours in prayer and Bible reading. My goodness, I just wish I could spend four more hours. I went down to Waco this week and uh, talking with a lady in the house, she said, well, Brother Raven, this word, you know, I, <laughs> I found out she gets up every morning at half past four. And she's middle-aged, she's 50 odd, I'm sure, maybe 60. I need two or three hours every morning before breakfast. I even take the telephone off the hook so nobody can interrupt me. And I get still with God. And then she said, maybe 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, I put the phone on the hook and it didn't on 50 seconds before, buzz, 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 can I come and see you, buzz, 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 can I tell you what to do, buzz, 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 sure. Okay, let's wrap it up. What did John say? If we're really born of God, if we have a new nature, our fellowship is with the Father, with His Son, Jesus Christ, and we have fellowship one with another. You know what we've done? We've turned it all over. And we enjoy fellowship with each other a lot more than we enjoy fellowship with Christ. Our fellowship is with the Father, first of all, to thank Him for His unspeakable, unspeakable gift. To thank Him that He didn't cut us off when we were in a hellhole somewhere. Or stinking with pride. Our fellowship is with the Father. Well, I had a wonderful Father and I like to talk to my Father. And then with His... We have fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, for His redemptive work. And then we have fellowship one with another. But let's keep them in the right order. And let's remember that the anomalous situation is this. That if I'm healthy, my appetite for God and the Word and prayer and so forth is not going to shrink. It's going to expand. And a little guy that sits down in the morning and he takes his, uh, whatever he takes, post toasted or whatever he takes, you get him a little cup and he spills much of the milk and he's not looking what he's doing and he maybe only eats half of it and then when he gets to 16 you say only one bowl so he gets one about this size as big as he can and he fills it with all the stuff he can and, and as he gets stronger then he becomes an athlete I was in a home not long ago and I, I said to the lady how old are you born? he's not 15 yet good night well I said he eats enough for three men He's an athlete, sturdy legs, big muscles, swimming champion. Oh man, what a body he's got on him. And naturally you expect that because he has that big frame to keep up, well, he's going to have a big, healthy, strong appetite. Well, God delights us. Delights in us when we spend time with him. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Spend much time in secret. Who wrote that silly hymn? A little talk with Jesus makes it right. All right, that's pure nonsense. If you love somebody, you like to be in company with them. 
you make excuses to see them. Even if you fall in love here, you go around a tree or somewhere and, and uh, you know the girl's coming the other way and you go around the other way just to meet her, you know. You, you, you suddenly fill your horizon or something else, whether it's anywhere else. You want to see the person you love. You want to talk with the person you love. You want to express your love to the person you love. And it's easy to sit in church and say, My Jesus, I love thee. And then we start him of our fellowship. Will a man rob God? Well, I think that's a good checkpoint at the end of every day. Say, Lord, how much time have I given to you today? Well, how much work have I done? First and foremost, I'm a love slave of Jesus Christ. I hate to disappoint people. People say, well, will you come and preach for us in 1984? 19 what? We're having a rally in 1984. Oh, I may be in glory looking at you. <laughs> I won't promise, I'll say, maybe I'll come, because I hate to break a promise. I hate to disappoint people. But most of all, I hate to disappoint God. I don't want him to say, look, he's, that son of mine is always taking, taking, taking. Again, finish with the prodigal. What does the prodigal say? He goes up to his father and he says, hey, Dad, you're worth millions. Now, come on, divide it. Give me, give me, give me, give me. What did he say when he came home? make me make me well is that what Jesus said to the disciples come on follow me and I will make you and I got saved when I was 14 and that's just over 60 years ago and I thought you know when I'd been serving the Lord about 20 oh and when I oh mercy I, I was pastor of the largest holiness church in England bigger than any Nazarene church <laughs> and then our group joined the Nazarene afterwards but you know I used to think after this I'm sure there'll be no more school of suffering trial difficulty I mean I've got all the answers I've worked with theology I've got oh my I'm still learning there's still much land ahead to be possessed and we get there by obedience we get there by submission we get there by being meek. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. You can't remember it. I can remember as a young man and Hitler had his hand up and he was shrieking with a terrible voice of his, the third Reich, he said. It will last a thousand years. It didn't last a thousand weeks. Don't be bothered about Hitler today. His name stinks. The righteous shall inherit the earth. And we need to know that righteousness through the cleansing of the blood, through the indwelling of the Spirit of God, and by constant submission to God and constantly reading the Word and constant prayer. The possibilities of grace are limitless. The paradox is that Christ is the hunger and He's the bread. He's satisfying and yet He draws us on to more satisfaction. Father, we thank you tonight for this break, this time of quietness and this change. We pray, Lord, that you teach us by your Spirit what we need to know. We pray that we may have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We never get caught in the trap of thinking we have righteousness of our own. It's all of yourself. It's all of your mercy that we're not consumed. If we're cleansed, it's because of your blood. If we're victorious, it's because of your power within us, not anything of our own. And Lord, we pray that we may be so indwelt with your Spirit that we radiate the love of God. You said we should be filled. And I guess we can't fathom the mystery of that, but I'm sure it means we'll be filled with peace and we'll be filled with joy and we'll be filled with power and we'll be filled with purity. Because you can satisfy that one thing that nothing material can ever satisfy, the spiritual center of our being, which can only be adequately satisfied by the indwelling of the Spirit of God. We thank you for your mercy, we thank you for your love, and we pray that we may lift your glory continually, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.